Hola. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Bien, ¿tú? Bien. Bueno, bienvenidos a todos a una nueva edición de Archivos Redux. Eh, hoy vamos a ver una conferencia de Michael Hensel del 8 de agosto de 2019, Embedded Architectures, allá en el aula magna, ¿no? Sí, que también como la de la semana pasada fue Jessy, ¿no? Eh, que también era parte de la, de la, del lab, de esa semana eh, Michael dio un lab eh, en, en, en el segundo semestre del año pasado y, y esa es la conferencia que dio el jueves de, de esa semana. Claro, sí, 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 fue un, un lab eh, bastante intenso también, muy interesante, eh, y donde la propuesta creo del lab tenía bastante que ver con lo que después iba a ser la conferencia. Eh, creo que había una, una, un foco y una importancia muy grande eh, y una idea muy particular de investigación, me parece, o de, o de cómo es investigar eh, desde la arquitectura. ¿no? Exacto, sí, creo que, que si, nada, si tuviera que decir a alguien que está haciendo investigación como modo de práctica, ¿no? ese sería, sería Michael, ¿no? porque... Todos los, y es cierto lo que dices de que el, el lab era literalmente parte de lo que era como un proyecto de, de, los, de los que está haciendo, como si no, no había disociación entre las cosas que decía, las cosas que, que discutía, como que creo que la, la cuestión, bueno, el título de la charla y, de, y del lab mismo, que es esta idea de arquitectura embebida, tiene que ver uh -huh. con eso, como si fuera que la arquitectura... Eh, incluye, y, 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 pero siempre es una y es como straightforward, ¿no? Sí, creo que hay, hay algo de que uno, en una primera lectura eh, de, o una primera visión de, de la conferencia eh, podría pensar que, en, que la propuesta de arquitectura que hace Michael Hensel no tiene eh, inercia, tradición, disciplina, historia, eh, digamos, atributos que generalmente están... Eh, atribuidos o que caracterizan lo que se suele llamar como la interioridad de la disciplina. Eh, pero, no sé cómo lo pensás vos, pero sin embargo me parece que, que eso está, pero está en un sentido mucho más abstracto, ¿no? Claro, como la idea de ambiente eh, contiene una idea de cultura que creo que después despliega como esos realms que dices, pero claramente no está, no está hablando en esos términos. Es como si estuviera mediado, ¿no? Por, por la idea de ambiente, como, como el ambiente como algo que tiene esas, esas condiciones, son parte de sí, eh, entonces se estudia a través de eso, pero nunca va a, a generar como categorías tradicionales, sino que, eh, bueno, o, o antes me comentabas que te parecía que no había un trabajo como a lo mejor figurativo, ¿no? como que no, difícilmente claro. ¿no? Se, se constituye una figuración de, de eso. Claro, sí, como se, se relaciona con el ambiente, o más bien construye un ambiente que eh, está entendido bastante arquitectónicamente, eh, en, en, en un sentido abstracto, en un sentido como el, el modo de hacer, el, la ética, eh, claro. la, la construcción de relaciones, eh, el uso de, de, de los dibujos, de, o de la visualización, eh, de pensar visualmente, eh, pero, pero sin dejar de pensar abstractamente. Claro, de hecho usaba eh, uno de los eh, ejemplos que fue muy pregnante porque, porque se habló después, lo, lo tuvimos en común varios días después, esa, esa, están esas barreras eh, vegetales que, que se hacen por, el, eh, digamos, por la torsión o el twisting de, de, las, de los propios troncos que se entrelazan y, y crecen esa especie de, de, de no sé, bushes o no sé cómo sería, eh, que dividen el territorio, ¿no? Entonces, el efecto local, material, de cómo se comporta la madera eh, para generar ese entramado, y ese entramado que está como arquitecturizado con una, con una idea que en realidad es, viene de, de, de la tradición, en el sentido de las inteligencias, del hacer eh, más primitivas, si se quiere, reconocerlas, eh, volverlas... Eh, forma, eh, performatividad, y después además que eso tenga eh, una condición de operar en múltiples escalas, incluso diría en escalas casi eh, no, no progresivas, sino eh, creo que le, eh, insistía en esto de lo múltiple, que no significa que sea como powers of ten, sino la, de la escala chica a la escala grande, ¿no? Como saltando de escala. Sí, eh. sí, 
buenísimo, claro, como de sí, multiescalar eh, o simultáneamente operando en, en, en escalas muy diversas. Eh, no, y lo que decías me parecía que sí, que uno podría ver como hay una idea de, como de, sí, de embedded, pero ese, ese, ese embuimiento, embebimiento, implica también cierta desviación, ¿no? O sea, las estructuras esas de los árboles siempre están artificializ artificialmente desviadas por tal o cual motivo, que sea de optimización de las performances o de, incluso hay características más culturales o del uso cultural eh, uh -huh. eh, para dar y así, ¿no? Claro, sí. Sí, y a lo mejor eh, para, para un poco como pensar hacia dónde va o cuál es la práctica que, que ejerce en los ejemplos que, que vimos, primero que eran muy, muy continentales europeos en gran medida, eh, cosa que es, es, es difícil operar en ese contexto que está como muy trabado y creo que hablaba de, de, la, de la condición de los proyectos como también eh, confiando o queriendo construir la arquitectura como centro, lo cual las, las otras disciplinas se embeben y no en un trabajo a través eh, o de, de, porque tenía como que gestionar lógicas más políticas, si se quiere, o de, o de gestión de recursos, ¿no? O, eh, como que comentaba que había siempre una interacción con actores de mundos muy distintos, pero su discurso no es el discurso este como eh, de, o transdisciplinar o interdisciplinar, sino de que la arquitectura lo embebía en el proyecto. Entonces, como si fuera más eh, un cuerpo que, que, que atomiza est estos movimientos. Y creo que la condición europea eh, también tiene eso, que es que tiene muchos actores, ¿no? como muchas estructuras, que, con las cuales al final iba y decía, bueno, estábamos en Italia y queríamos resolver tal problema de aterrazamiento de tal campo que tiene una, una condición territorial muy delimitada, muy clara. O sea, como que el territorio tiene mucha, tiene mucha data. Eh, y, a, y, y hablaba de la data y de la información como un problema a tratar, digamos, ¿no? Como si fuera la gestión de eso. Totalmente. Me parece que en eso que decís, eh, lo que funciona como plano, como sustrato, es, es el territorio y finalmente es donde toda esa investigación, eh, no sé si es que se aplica o, o se ejerce o, se, o, o, o encuentra una finalidad o construye una finalidad, pero me parece que hay como cierta convergencia eh, de toda esa investigación y de, y de toda esa relación con actores heterogéneos eh, en una aplicación en el territorio, ¿no? Claro, eh, exacto. Sí, como una cosa intensiva de intervención intensiva cargada de, de contenidos eh, que, se, que se integran. Eh, sí, me parece que, que ese es un poco su tono también. Creo, creo que hay algo divertido, a lo mejor ahora para pasar a escucharlo a él, que es como tiene un humor, eh, tiene, tiene, pero como muy... Tiene una, de esos humores en los cuales es, ahora acaba de... En realidad lo está se está riendo de ese problema, ¿no? O sea, como que genera la, la, ese marco y, y se ríe de ese marco para no sufrirlo también, ¿no? Y para darle como un poco clave de judo, darle vuelta y decir, bueno, entonces operamos con eso. Como que nunca, nunca va a decir, esto fue muy difícil, esto no se puede hacer, ¿no? Como que claro. siempre le encuentra la vuelta. Claro, claro, sí, sí, sí. Sí, digamos, en ese sentido la investigación obviamente tiene una, una componente analítica, pero después tiene una... En realidad el, el análisis muy rápidamente está pe pensado, puesto en relación con la acción, digamos, uh -huh. o con, con su claro. finalidad. Bueno, eh, <ríe> creo que no se lo pensó. Buenísimo. Vemos entonces... La, entonces la, vemos la película. El, Veámosla la... y la semana que viene es la última, así que... Así es. Bueno. La semana que viene. Muy bien, hasta la próxima. Gracias.
Eh, voy a hablar en inglés, así que nuestro invitado Michael eh, sabe de lo que estamos hablando. So, once again, thanks for being here. We are having a, a lecture by Michael Hensel. Thank you for being here. Um, he will be presented by the Dean of the School of Architecture, Ciro Nagle, in just a minute. I would like to give a, a brief context on where the, this lecture is, uh, is happening. Um, it's been organized uh, jointly by the Center of Studies of Contemporary Architecture and the undergrad program of the School of Architecture in the context of the, of the lab. Our, Workshop, an intense workshop of one week that will be uh, coming into review this Saturday at 2 p.m. That I invite everybody to be to be there. It's going to be an interesting uh, moment for exchanges and conversations about the, the projects uh, each studio is producing. And uh, the, the lecture is, uh, is framed in, in a series of lectures that we've been doing for some time now called Influential Theories, where we, we like to present and expose uh, and invite uh, different architects to present different uh, theories, different inclinations, and uh, heterogeneous uh, propositions, and, and even dogmas. And we like this uh, ability, uh, something that is regarded of, of theory to uh, stage, and even produce new forms of uh, relevance, and, 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 and set the, the conversation of the Architectural uh, discourse, uh, the contemporary architectural discourse, and, um, and without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Ciro. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, Uh, I'm deeply honored and sincerely happy at the personal level, at a minute, to introduce Michael Hensel, German architect from the Cologne University of Applied Sciences, graduate diploma from the Architectural Association School of Architecture, and PhD from the University of Reading School of Construction Management and Engineering, to our school, and more extensively to the architectural scene in Buenos Aires. When I think of Michael, I think, on the one hand, of a peculiarly steady, thorough, perseverant, resilient academician, particularly generous about his time, well organized and unusually dedicated, for I'm not entirely sure what reason, perhaps because of the cultural environment in which he grew up and his basic formation as an architect in Germany, from which I know little, perhaps as a result of his, from what I heard, harsh formation as an advanced architect at DIA graduate school, graduate design group in the mid-90s, uh, the early ADL with Kipnitz and Barham, uh, Barham Schilder, perhaps due to the demanding, and I would say, hot academic context in which he took part. Particularly as a young professor at the AA in the late 90s and early 2000s, when he first taught with Bema Berkel, who I believe has had a, a strong influence in his type of architecture, and when I, chan when I had the chance to meet him, right at the moment of his intellectual emancipation and progressive unfolding, and sharing a series of very passionate years, thinking prematurely, uh, but with an amazing vehemence and a strong series of beliefs about the state of the art of the discipline. And when I witnessed his development uh, of an every year more sophisticated, more daring, and more complex design theories and methodologies around a number of issues that anticipated some of the lineages that more or less normatively nowadays structure the contemporary formation of the architect. In other words, I think of Michael as a forward-looking but not noticeably steady professor, which we have uh, enjoyed so far these days, devoted to the formation of the architect in contemporary culture. Additional proofs of this are uh, his often unknown 
uh, fact, the, the open and known fact uh, that that um, some of his disciplines, disciples include people like Archimedes or Nelly Ox Oxman, and, he, and Michael is behind uh, some of these. On the other hand, and intriguing, intriguingly enough, given, given this steady devotion, when I think of Michael, I also think of a turbulent, curious, vigorous, greedy, uh, and voracious researcher, a reckless intellectual in, in constant search for a ground, or better, for a medium where to expand his interests and more generally those of the contemporary discipline. One can go not only to develop and refine research, or to unfold complexity along the, along the lines of previous research, but one willing to literally initiate, define, construct, or nurture research mediums as such. That is, a researcher, a researcher that not only does research, but that opens new spaces for research, for himself or for others. Somebody that does not just fit into established fields, constrained and conditioned by given standards, but that challenges them by configuring entirely new ones, often speculating at levels that at the time of these processes remain unfamiliar for the discipline, and even for himself. And therefore advancing research at the level of not only progressing or deepening, the field, uh, not even at one of expanding horizons, uh, but at the level of establishing entirely new grounds, unstable ones, and yet not merely bizarre. One can only admire his courage by witnessing the prolific, unorthodox, and geographically mobile career that he has conducted at this level. From his forward-looking doings at the AI, through his uh, I would say famous Diploma Unit 4 and the graduate program in emerging technologies that he co-founded at the time when such abstract idea of technology did not really exist and when even the idea of it itself of emergence was only an intuition to the later research center for architecture and tectonics and the advanced computational design laboratory that he has until recently directed at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, where he was also professor of, for architecture, to the department for digital architecture and planning that he now heads at TUVM, where he serves as a professor and a board member of the Center for Geometry and Computational Design. Thirdly, when I think of Michael, I think of his overall maritime enterprise in its many versions, from the young years of ocean, the influential, but more importantly, the open-ended interdisciplinary design network in the mid-90s and early 2000s, again, at the time where the interdisciplinarity was not much more than a promise. And when the idea of thinking of an architectural office as a network was barely there to the Ocean Design Research Association of the past 10 years, to C, uh, which I didn't know about, the Sustainable Environment Association that he established in Norway, which, as, as, he, as, as he disputed some sources, is directed to pursue systematic integrative inquiry into how the built environment interacts with the natural. Over to the more recent version, the Ocean Architecture Environment, fusing the two previous. Of this, aside the names, um, what really strikes me is to think of Michael as this inventor of forms of practice, this really stubborn settler of grounds for our practice. I think of him as a navigator, ethically operating in a realm that, ex that radically expands the Kulhasian sense of the surfer, who deals with the way of late capitalism without interfering with them, but rather using their force, into a form of architect, thinker and researcher that sometimes serves, sometimes writes, sometimes cruises, sometimes dives in, sometimes stays immersed for large periods, but one that is not only driven to produce, not even that just wants to discover new territories, but a navigator that in that multifarious and multitasking process wishes to create new ones. He says that his practice, as in the subtitle, uh, is located at the intersection of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, climatology, and ecology. I would say that, furthermore, 
It is itself the mix of those what he uses to define every time more daringly new extents for our discipline. I would, in that sense, propose him as a builder or maker of new architectural domains. I'm therefore very happy that Michael's, Michael is here with us this week, teaching our 10th lab, rigorously meeting and talking non-stop, as I have seen him with all our professors, sharing thoughts with our students, and I'm sure influencing the still subtle mind of our school. Thank you, my friend, for being here, and please join me in giving him a welcome. Thank you, Cyril. This was uh, movingly generous to the extent that I think there must be another Michael Hansen that you're talking about. It can't be me, really. It's me embarrassing, but thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, yes. First of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, second of all, and more so, thank you for letting us invigorate our exchange. That for me was very important. And so, can I keep this? This is so nice. Can I, really, I can show this to someone. He said, see what's happening. No, um, you see, precisely because this is a moment of coming together again, for me, that is very important, I thought I would start this by saying somewhere between 2000 and 2004, 2005, I lost some of my most important sparring partners at day. Cyril went away, Chris Hyde went away. So a vacuum of sorts, uh, not easy to be filled, because there's only one way of moving forward, and that is together with others. You cannot refresh your mind. You cannot sort of rethink things without the probing questions of your keen colleagues. <laughs> Uh, that watch very carefully over the nonsense that I sort of proliferate at time and um, sort of give guidance through incredible conversations. So I lost my sparring partners. I had a vacuum. I thought, well, maybe I'll do a PhD then if it's like that. <laughs> and um, I was thinking for a long time what I might do about the PhD, but. Uh, thinking through some of the aspects that were always somehow present in a named or an unnamed way and during years of work was this question of the interaction between architecture and the environment, this kind of dynamic. And I thought then to phrase my PhD around that and to take up a word that was floating around at the time and partly strongly contested between different groups that would still probably uh, break into the form and function camps, claiming uh, sort of hold over this word and uh, giving it sort of a determination either in the direction of something more artistic, let's say, something more explorative in this kind of domain versus others that were going perhaps into uh, what could be termed a little bit different in this domain. And I thought, okay, let's try and see if we can somehow find a middle ground between these. In fact, I've never done anything new. I've always only resisted uh, certain dichotomies that um, I somehow thought intuitively were not so productive. Yeah, so I did my PhD. It had a different subtitle than this book, uh, but uh, my editor at the time thought non-discrete architecture, non-anthropocentric ar architecture doesn't really say very much to the readership, and uh, I, I can uh, only agree with this. But what it ended up being is insanely, insanely ambitious. So rethinking architecture, design, and the built environment. At the moment I had the first copy of the book in, in my hand, I couldn't believe that I had actually agreed to a subtitle like this. Uh, it's scary. Yeah. I'm mean, still scared, and I will probably spend the next 40 years, if I'm lucky enough to live so long, to try and work on that. Uh, I gave up any hope to work it out. So this kind of notion of performance-oriented architecture that I was trying to go after, in my view, was uh, something to do with architecture and environment interaction. 
two domains that are somehow in some format of exchange, productive exchange of sorts. And more or less around the same time as completing this work, uh, I was luckily invited to a collaboration with Cornell University to do a series of symposia. The first one being sustaining sustainability. I somehow perceived that there already at the time of around 2012, there was a kind of uh, exhaustion of dealing with the subject of sustainability in some way or another. Nobody wanted to hear that word anymore. So how do we move forward with this? And this would still work somehow within the notion of architecture and environment interaction. But the second one, <coughs> Um, designing for bio, uh, or design for biodiversity actually moved away from that without me immediately noticing this at the time because that was looking for some sort of architecture and environment integration, uh, which is altogether a somewhat slightly different thing than just an interaction between two separate domains. And. Uh, now recently, I've been trying to build a network around this uh, set of questions in the center of Europe, and uh, we've run a series of symposia, and now this summer also be to be paralleled by a lab on the broader set of questions around that. So this is sort of like, uh, for those of you that know the work that I've done before, this is sort of like a move forward on, on this kind of work. And now I have to somehow reveal a little bit sort of thoughts and motivations behind it. Uh, already at the beginning of the lab, I offered this quote, uh, which was given by Leslie Martin, a very important UK-based architect who was also the initiator uh, of a research center in Cambridge. It is today named after him, uh, the Martin Center. And he said in 1967, the ultimate problem for the profession, meaning architecture, is that of setting out the possibilities and choices in building an environment. Not in doing a built environment, uh, but in building an environment. And I'm pretty sure that he doesn't mean a building the built environment, but that he's using this term in a much broader fashion if one looks at the work that uh, these guys were doing at the time in their research center. And mind you, research centers at that time were also not a kind of very uh, frequent occurrence. Of course, there were some research centers around. I think somewhere in the early 1950s, the first one was uh, founded in the United States. I think by Theodore Larson, if I remember correctly, Chris. Uh, called the ARL. I sometimes suspect that this was somehow the beginning of the DRL. Uh, and so this, these began to be clusters that were beginning to look at the world in a somewhat slightly different way, uh, where research became extremely structured, uh, where methods were developed, and where this whole uh, question of, in this particular case, the interaction between architecture and environment were in some way initiated. So I spare you other kind of quotes and other important things, but I, I just, for myself, I have, I have extracted this question. Can architecture be in the service of the biophysical environment? But the biophysical environment is a combination between the biological environment, meaning all the species that are around, uh, and the physical environment, which includes uh, geographical aspects, geological aspects, climate, etc., etc. So can architecture actually not be adverse? Can it not be sort of in the way an obstacle or some sort of problem? Can it be in the service? And you know, somehow <laughs> that question meant that my workplace changed. I find myself these days very often in some kind of strange situations in some field measuring things. Um, which is, uh, which is initially a little bit awkward, uh, and uh, very often my colleagues that come from the architecture side and collaborate in this find this intensely uncomfortable because we have to talk to people whose language we often don't understand. I will talk with you a little bit about the problems that uh, I perceive that uh, I'm trying to, to tackle with together with uh, colleagues. And already at this stage, what I want to say is today I'm not going to show anything that we're doing in practice. I'm only showing things that we're doing in the research environment, in the university, and works that we have done with students. 
I, I think this might be more interesting for everybody in the room than seeing another building or something designed by the, the office. So let's talk a bit about the problems. If we take an arrow of time, before much of human interaction in the environment, the physical environment, biological environment interacted in an unmediated fashion. But as humans start modifying the environment, the black uh, triangle growing over time, the more the local and the biological environment really get mediated by human interventions. And this obviously includes architecture. As for architecture, perhaps two big domains that are being modified uh, are of initial interest. The first one is the ground and the question of placing a building and the belief that where there is an object, a building, there cannot be ground. The second being the volume and with it the enclosure, the building envelope that modulates in some fashion or another, the interior, but not only. Uh, more and more we begin to see an appearance of the building physics of the exterior. And I will come to that. Folded into that is another problem that we see occurring in certain parts of the world, which is a diminishing of public and collective space for different reasons. And that poses also particular problems, for instance, access and utilization of ground. I will elaborate that a little bit. And in addition to that comes the realization that there exists something in our urban environment that you might call green urban infrastructure. So how does that play into the picture? Is this something that we fill the leftover place, spaces with? If not, if we give this extensive ground, how does that play into the general environment of commodification? Um, and what does this actually do for us? So we have basically three, three distinct sets of questions. Uh, how can the built environment be in the service of, a, um, or rather, how can architecture be in the service of the um, biophysical environment? And how do we deal with collective space uh, within that? I will draw a preliminary conclusion. And that preliminary conclusion is and that as we start modifying the environment, transforming it in some sort of fashion towards new solutions, these new solutions need to be anchored somehow, somewhere in cultural or landscape related practices that make these new spaces recognizable to people and, and immediately habitable to people. I will give some examples about that later on. So this dichotomy between the object and the ground leads to conditions that we know very well. So where you have your house, you do not have your garden. Where you have your street, you do not have your garden. So in a way, all these kinds of constructions which begin to organize and sort of separate uh, the environment into a fine mosaic bring with them that sort of the leftover areas are thought of as perhaps a garden, perhaps a park, as perhaps uh, some opportunity to introduce some green where there isn't some. But no matter where you look uh, in terms of architecture over the last century or two, uh, this kind of division leads to the same result, only that the emperor once in a while wears a new clothes. Uh, so this is not essentially different except in terms of size and proportion from um, the kind of spatial organization that I showed in the suburban environment. And more so, we find now increasingly large urban megastructures that resemble medieval castles, where perhaps the water moat around it is replaced with an eight-lane inner urban freeway, uh, accessible only to those citizens with the right credit card, who might then also live in those kind of defense towers. Likewise, we find on an urban scale even cities that resemble desert fortresses with a very hard edge, an edge of exclusion, a situation in which indeed the so-called public space in these kinds of settlements is no longer public in the sense that it's inclusive but where people are excluded. 
For me, it was a shock to learn that one of the new developments in Oslo would deliberately exclude gypsies, people of a low income, rough sleepers, etc. Those people were not allowed into that part of the city. A real problem. And if we take that to a mega scale, we can probably also say something about the Fortress Europe, huh? where again, sort of like the hard borders are established, and we may ask ourselves about the consequences. And we might ask ourselves about the consequences, what it means uh, to contest and to stand your ground in these kinds of situations. This was a little bit abstract. I will tie that down to another problem. There's a whole host of aspects to do with the biological environment that we actually do not design for, even though uh, we know occurrences now of the sort of urban wildlife, like uh, this urban fox here for many decades, we make zero provision for that. This was not my garden, but I had an encounter like that in my garden in uh, Norway. It's uh, also usually an accidental situation, often leading to a bad result for the animals. But uh, in between, somebody also might get hurt. So it's sort of a remarkable thing that we do not design for that. And when these guys want to move in with us, we show them out. Sometimes with remarkably cruel results. Okay, so I just try to somehow hi highlight a little bit that there are perhaps some desirable conditions that in some places in the world are gradually designed away, i.e. open, exclusive, collective space. And then there are also phenomena in the action, interaction between urban environments and uh, individual architectures and with the biological environment which are basically deemed undesirable. This is an interesting realization. So having thought about that, for me, talking about user-centered design doesn't cut it because that boils down humans to people that have a kind of functional relation only to the things that they encounter around themselves. human center also doesn't cut it because it leaves all the other participants, stakeholders out. So I'm a kind of fervent supporter or fan of what is called a non-human turn, a kind of inclusive approach where the center is shared with others. Then the first question to me is, when we build and we aggregate buildings into a kind of settlement form, do we generate as an outcome a new possibility for a shared ground? This is Chantal uh, Huyik, one of the very big uh, Neolithic settlements in uh, Anatolia. And you may be right in pointing out that this settlement has a hard perimeter, much like what I showed you before. But what it also features is this roofscape. And this roofscape is indeed also the streetscape because you enter the house from the top. So to get to your house, you have to go over the houses of others, which requires some sort of unspoken agreement, a kind of common sense behavior. I suppose you don't just go buy somebody's entrance and throw your rubbish in there. You just There are certain rules of behavior which are customary. They are kind of, they've grown together with this uh, type of settlement. And that implies that we do not only have a, a shared public surface, but we also have a set of related practices. And that's uh, something that is really interesting, but often very difficult to find out. In this case, this is a picture uh, uh, of Udovsky's book, um, Architecture Without Architects. It's actually Yao Dong uh, buildings, which are courtyards dug out, which are accessed by a little stairway from the side. So you go underground, come into the courtyard, and you access the rooms from here. 
there's often a tree somewhere nearby the stair and some big rocks. I assume that these are mainly there to settle the ground because this is very soft ground that is blown around by the wind. Uh, and here it's very hard to say what was the practice that was related to occupying this shared space here in between. The Yaodong still exists, there's still a lot of people living there, but by and large they are now disengaged from agricultural practices and so on, so it's very hard to deduce what the practice of sharing the space was in relation to this type of surface organization. It's also quite interesting to see that an architecture could be a series of voids rather than a series of objects. Or something like this. This is a star fortress. And I'm not talking about these buildings, no. I'm talking more about this kind of structure that begins to structure the, the landscape. And if this wasn't a defense mechanism, you could perhaps look at alternative ways of inhabiting this. Practices and ways of inhabiting landscape that are somehow diminishing, yeah, like for instance uh, nomadic lifestyles like this, but they're not diminishing completely. You see remnants of them in places like Istanbul and so on, where green spaces which are left over are occupied. And they're occupied because they correlate to uh, the, the Middle Eastern form of the square, the Maidan, uh, uh, which was a, a kind of leftover area, green space between uh, tent camps, the people occupied for training purposes, for training the horses, for sitting and eating, for socializing and so on. So these kinds of practices somehow survive on these leftover green spaces between streets and uh, urban freeways and so on in, in Turkey. A lot of the other related practices to nomadism may be gone, but still you find this. In this kind of inhabitation of uh, the land, of the ground, also follows particular rules. Some of the perhaps most explicit practices to do with individually and collectively inhabiting landscape is the Scandinavian or other Scandinavian versions of the right to roam, which gives you somehow the rules by which you can walk into forest areas that uh, are not normally publicly owned. And in Scandinavia, these come from early, very early medieval times, where land was predominantly privately owned. So let's say you had to take a pilgrimage from Oslo to Trondheim, you couldn't actually do it without moving over privately owned land. So these common sense behaviors turned into customary rules in a way. These included things like closing the gate behind you when you walk through so that the cattle doesn't escape, this included that you were allowed to pick berries or, or apples, but you were obviously not allowed to destroy the bushes or damage them. And it also entailed that you were allowed to camp on that side for up to four days to rest, to gather your strength again before you move on, given that you respect the private sphere of the house and the owners. Interestingly, it is not laid out what such a violation would be, because somehow it is culturally ingrained. There's a particular kind of understanding that is passed from generation to generation what you would do and what you wouldn't do. So you wouldn't put your tent right in front of the bathroom window of somebody else, just to give a kind of silly example. When I arrived to Oslo, I got very curious about this every man's right uh, and the way it was still enacted in the landscape. By that time, in Norway, it's actually a customary law enshrined in the Outdoor Recreation Act. In Sweden, by the way, it's constitutional right. Um, so it's really rather quite strong in terms of its anchoring. Um, I was quite intrigued that these kinds of rules were accepted and enjoyed as a norm in the landscape, but that the urban environment developed in the exact opposite direction of exclusion of undesired people from certain parts of the city. I thought, 
to some extent this didn't compute for me because it just produced the schizophrenia. How do I behave in totally opposite directions in the city and in the landscape? You could accept that. I found it kind of weird, so I began to ask myself what would be the urbanism or what would be the, the architecture of the everyman's right. But this is really what I mean by practices. These practices do not have to, and they never do, stay steady in time. They get updated. For instance, nowadays, these rules in Auto Recreation Act also includes things like if you use somebody's private waterway with a motorboat, how fast can you go, how much noise can you make, and so on. So these develop in time, too. The only thing is my argument is that if we design something uh, that looks radically new, somewhere in this setup, something needs to be recognizable for people in terms of these cultural or landscape-related practices so that they can enact their life and the things that they need to do within this new environment. Now, a small uh, change of pace. I, I want to talk a little bit about the terrain as a sort of the basic condition of ground uh, and the relationship of architecture to that. You find very often in Scandinavia uh, that the traditional architecture does not modify the ground. It stays relatively intact. Uh, there's not no bulldozers, no mm, blowing away entire hills made from granite, but instead these differences in the terrain form are used strategically to rotate your house, to place your house, to dimension your house in such a way that maybe it is a little bit away from the neighbors, so less disturbance, but gets still good light, maybe not uh, total exposure to the storm, and so on. In other words, terrain form is an asset. It is something seen to be strategized for your purpose to get a desirable outcome for your dwelling. It's also interesting that very often these architectures touch the ground really rather lightly. So the ground almost stays entirely intact. I thought at some point maybe it was really quite nice to begin to catalog such things. I will only show you a few examples, and this will happen a few times during my talk that I will show you examples from others because you don't need to invent the entire world uh, yourself. You can have a look what people do. Uh, I wanted to get a somewhat more local example. This is um, from the open city in Pentoc in Chile, and you see here uh, how in this amphitheater this water run off where during heavy times of precipitation is incorporated and it even splits sort of the, um, the place uh, where the actors stand, where the orators stand, where the performers stand. And the seating is, arises out of a small modification of the surface as is. So in other words, there is transformation, but it's the transformation that takes what is there as an asset in order to um, be somehow thoughtful with the resources, but also leading to, I think, a particular quality of design result. I don't think that it's only a, a question of economy. I think it's also a question of a particular kind of spatiality in the study. This is a wonderful example by Alvaro Caesar, a swimming pool nearby Porto, which utilizes the existing rocks and outcrops and completes them with an intervention that makes the particular use possible. And then because of a conversation I was having this morning, I thought to include this, this project. Sometimes you're in an environment where there isn't any particular ground anymore because it has already been bulldozed. There are some really interesting projects like uh, the Brazilian Pavilion for the Osaka Expo that begins to construct the ground, that sets bases into that ground, that puts a canopy over it, but by and large leaves the surfaces open and accessible. So these, these kinds of ways of treating the ground, there are many. I don't want to show many more examples, but for me the question is, if we now say these are individual buildings, these are idiosyncratic, particular, special buildings, 
if we remove this status, we would say, what if we were to build an entire neighborhood out of those? So we move the extraordinary to the ordinary, and then we'll see what this actually allows us to do. Because most of these buildings that uh, I find particularly interesting do not suggest in themselves larger architectures yet. But the first thing that you can do is you can ask, what if we aggregate these and this becomes sort of the norm, this becomes sort of the everyday building, and we have multiples of those, what would this actually result in? And then I don't only want to talk about humans all the time. There's a rich history uh, in um, building for, for animals. These are the famous pigeon towers in Isfahan. They're built for wild, undomesticated pigeons, sometimes up to 10,000 in one of them. And the reason for doing that is uh, when the Safavid Shah um, Abbas I moved the capital uh, of the Shah, the Safavid Empire to Isfahan, on this high plain, the soil was not fertile enough to produce all the necessary food for the anticipated population. So the food needed extra nutrients. The nutrients that come from the droppings of those pigeons. So the towers are actually there to literally, forgive the word, collect pigeon shit, that then goes onto the fields. And it's harvested once a year. I was curious about that because I was wondering how do you design for a pigeon? I mean, you cannot say, are you decently comfortable? How's it going in there? Um, so you, you have to make certain stipulations. And obviously, these, these towers are already at the very height of this type of development. Uh, it is very likely that they started as much more modest, small uh, vernacular types huh, where uh, people try to see, can they actually attract some pigeons to be there, how does it work, and all the rest of it. But what I find remarkable uh, about these buildings at this stage, is if you look at the 24-hour exposure of these buildings to uh, a vast increase in uh, outdoor uh, temperature, so that you see that the surface goes from somewhere around 20 degrees all the way up to you cannot really see 35, 40 degrees on the outside, the interior stays stable. You could say, okay, that's easy enough. We just make the walls thick enough, basta. But it's not only like this. You also have airflow going in. The air needs to be renewed. So the turrets at the top where the pigeons fly in and out are also the ventilation uh, mechanism. And for the temperature to stay stable inside, this would actually entail to control the amount and the velocity of the airflow so that it uh, uh, gets into an equilibrium with the surface temperature or of the material on the interior. Now that is fine tuning, if you ask me. That's incredible. Right? And if we can do this kind of thing for pigeons, it makes me wonder why we don't do that for ourselves somehow. Um, just to show you, this is from the West Country in England, where nearly every house used to have somewhere uh, one wall for having pigeons. You would have them to get some eggs, maybe some feathers, maybe even once in a while eat a pigeon. Hopefully not too often, because then they don't come anymore. So I started thinking this is really interesting. So some part of the space that you make an effort for to build is actually given to something else with a return value for you. But we are not even interested in the return value anymore. Today, commodity is somewhat going into the, the uh, direction of taking the full allowed footprint for a building minus the thickness of the wall, and the rest is climatized interior. We do not afford a kind of transitional space, a kind of extended threshold today, because that sells for less money. I was quite shocked when I moved recently uh, from one place to another in Munich, where you can see each block when it was designed from the 1950s until today, and every decade you see less of the transitional space, and today there's not even a balcony anymore. It's also interiorized space, because the balcony sells only at 50% of the price of an interior. This is how it goes. So if we want to proliferate that way, there is not going to be any room for this. There's only going to be room for this. Let's remove everything. Also, uh, 
all of humans have always designed very nicely for plants. And this is in Lanzarote, so these little kind of indentations in the ground were made with the semicircle wall. So when, when it rains, the water accumulates here. This bit of the ground in this kind of ditch is more moist, so it helps sustaining these, uh, these wine plants here. Or in this case, a walled garden on the island of Pantelleria. It's an Italian island off the coast of uh, Tunisia. And here, this green wall garden is built to sustain one citrus tree, maybe a lemon tree, maybe an orange tree, because these remote islands have no source of vitamin C. And a major effort needed to be made to have it. The interesting thing about this uh, thick thermal wall is that uh, it's not only protecting the tree from the hot winds, but more so, it's actually creating a microclimate inside here. Due to the temperature gradient and the diurnal temperature difference, you get a lot of condensation on the inside of the wall. The, the water runs down into the ground. And the hot air doesn't heat it up and dries it out very quickly. So the, the microenvironment inside of this ring wall is considerably different from the situation outside. Terrace landscapes, same situation. First of all, terrace landscapes occur because there's not enough flat ground to do agriculture, but also because terraces prevent landslides. You stabilize this ground, you produce a lot of strips of uh, horizontal space on which you can grow produce. And the interesting thing is that the combination of the soil formation together with the dry stone walls that maintain the soil in this kind of position changes the microclimate. Uh, particularly on higher altitudes, where the temperature might drop quickly in the evening, so you don't get enough hours of this effective temperature bracket between 20 and 30 degrees centigrade in which photosynthesis takes place. So if you don't get it, you get a bad wine. If you do get these hours, you get a good wine. It's a huge difference. Huh? Uh, so I will show you a project that we did on this in a little while, but I still want to go on a little bit about the examples. This is a very nice one uh, in Iran. This is Fin Garden in, um, in Kashan. And the water for this garden is brought from far away through Kanat, um, the low ground water systems that collect the rain of water in the foothill of the mountains and sometimes over a distance of 40 kilometers or so brings the water, delivers it. And you see it's, this facilitates not only this garden, it also facilitates the agriculture in the area. Uh, I show you this garden because we wanted to do an analysis on this kiosk here um, because it really looked like a very interesting free-running building. Um, but it occurred to us immediately that we cannot get a good understanding of the behavior of this free-running building without considering the vegetation around it and the microclimate generated by it. So any analysis that we had to do, to do with shading, to do with solar exposure, to do with airflow, always needed to feature the vegetation as part of it. Everything else would give you a result that does not really reflect on what's going on there. This image I'm showing you only because we had to resort to some kind of uh, forms of illustrations that are readable to the layman. Yeah, and so basically this is an overlay of, a, of a, a kind of rendering with the airflow analysis that makes it more tangible to see why things are actually moving in a particular way. It's a pictorial information together with a kind of database information that makes it somewhat a little bit more accessible. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, with this kind of extraordinary buildings that upon aggregation may actually be the, the, the kind of normal, uh, these walled gardens, they also don't stand alone. There are many examples, like this one in Montreuil nearby Paris, which, are, which was an extensive area built like this. You can compare this, for instance, with uh, Westland in Holland, where you now have all the, um, the glass houses. This was pre-glass house. And the point of having these walled gardens is to sustain the peach growing industry here. And uh, this is really quite interesting that architecture is modulating this environment in that sense. 
And recently, in a silly moment over beer drinking, as I was sitting in Vienna suffering from the heat island effect there, I was thinking, yeah, <clears throat> like in times before, uh, maybe the cities will become our quarries at the time when we have to serve the circulation system differently, then we will probably cut up the asphalt areas and the, beton, uh, and the, the concrete areas and probably remember that they could be used also to benefit when rearranged in space and could support uh, the growth of produce or or particular conditions for plants required. This is another intense example in Tomari, where you see all these walls being built on a relatively flat landscape. This is there to change the microclimate so that you can grow the wine in favorable situations. I'm showing you this only to say that for some of the examples we already know, uh, not just individual interventions, but rather a lot of ground taking, very large accumulative intervention of that sort. <clears throat> but when it comes to the question of ground, the question is also how to deal with the partitioning of the landscape into a small, fine mosaic very often uh, by infrastructure like this. And most of you would have already seen these kind of green bridges that are now popping out everywhere. And the other question is, of course, how to facilitate um, perhaps pedestrian circulation through such areas. Now, if you allow me, I will digress for just one moment. Over the last 10 years, I've also taken an intense interest in uh, how practices are beginning to embrace research as part of their practice model. Um, and we have mapped by now something like 40, 50 practices across the world and uh, look at how do they organize themselves around research, how do they build it into their business model, what kind of questions are they asking. And one of the big questions that is coming up more and more and more is not just to do a green roof, but to actually record and register over time what is actually growing there, how much of it. Is it changing? What is the change indicating? Is the change perhaps an indicator of climate change or, or, or uh, what kind of dynamics are at stake? So this is the picture that I showed you early on. Uh, there are many practices that are mobilizing in this direction. So I'm not talking about something purely theoretical that has at the moment no relevance in practice. <laughs> The, this kind of phenomenon has arrived in select practices that are gearing up towards it. Here on Timberlake is a particularly interesting case. They have about, I don't know, by now 140, 150 people on the office floor, of which 15 are researchers that are either not architects or people with double degrees. So these are on the office floor. Uh, in terms of project situation, they work with the other architects in the office, which means that the other architects in the office have to know how to speak the language of, for instance, uh, a biologist or uh, environmental chemist, etc. Uh, so the, the language begins to be negotiated uh, truly into a, a kind of exchange environment that might be called interdisciplinary at that point, even though the target output is often architecture, but it's not always the case. Kieran Timberlake also does research and other kinds of things that don't normally fall under, uh, into, the, 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 the shed, uh, into the the kind of scheme of ultimately producing a building. Okay, small change of pace, but this is again going to be about examples. Several weeks ago, uh, I received a curious invitation to a workshop uh, at the ETH in Zurich, uh, which was run by the Center for Cognitive Sciences. And they were dealing with the question of how we perceive density. Because in Europe, I don't know how it is here, but in Europe, uh, there is an intense pressure on cities densifying rather than growing. Uh, and what the perception of density does to us. So I wanted to ask the question differently. I actually, as normal, I don't do what I'm asked to do. I do something else for some strange reason. And I, I was asking myself, are there densities that we can look at that don't stress us? Like this, for instance. That's pretty dense. Uh, you don't get so stressed. But if this would be sort of like two meters away, another tower in Hong Kong, you look out of your window and 
try to people look back at you, maybe this could be stressful. So I started wondering, is there a possibility and are there kinds of projects that are beginning to suggest a different kind of interface with, with vegetation? Again, these are individual extraordinary buildings, but I'm asking myself if we had like a hundred of those as a cluster somewhere, what kind of situation would they produce? So, for instance, Lila Bobadi's glass house in uh, Sao Paulo, which has this uh, atrium here, you access the house from below. You could even imagine that this ground surface here is kept entirely wild. You could imagine that if a garden is needed and you wanted to grow carrots, you would do that on the roof. So you begin to play with this diagram and try and imagine how this might work. Now this is the house from below. And it is obviously not enough just to imagine the house. You have to somehow look for guidelines for how such a thing might be uh, aggregated, how such a building might become a kind of fabric. And uh, even for this, there might be interesting examples. Here we come back to the question of practice. This is uh, an image of Mardin, a uh, medieval town in the southeast of Anatolia in Turkey. And the interesting thing here is that the roof of each building forms sort of the court, the front yard of the house above. But not only that, the uphill circulation entails that you're coming up a stair and maybe you have to go over the stairs to get to the next stair and up. So it's not just that the below neighbor and the above neighbor are sharing the space, it's also that randomly people are walking through there. And obviously there must be some sort of customs, uh, some kind of rules of behavior that are ingrained for people not to start shooting at each other when such a, an encounter occurs. There are very interesting examples of buildings that begin to define the envelope in such a fashion that there is a kind of transitional space. Spaces that are shared always with unexpected guests uh, and where perhaps there is a transitional zone for the vegetation as well. For microclimatic purposes, really interesting. There are also buildings that nearly disappear. They are almost camouflaged by the vegetation because even in the footprint of the building itself, by this house in Cap Valat and by La Caton Versailles, the trees penetrate the volume. So you would actually imagine how an entire forest is uh, absorbing these kinds of houses. The normal question that I get at this point, yeah, but Michael, what about fire? I, I come to that later on. I'll tell you something more about fire. <clears throat> so this house, for instance, is also masked uh, by, by trees built around it that form a second perimeter. And now you can imagine the next house could just be a meter away, but when you look out of your window, you don't see the house, you see the tree. These are perceived densities that perhaps do something else to our perception, to our expectation, to our experience of space and quality of space than uh, without these things. And these architects have also speculated about it. They have thought, okay, uh, maybe even the courtyard can be formed rather by trees than the building, so we don't really need structure, we need pruning. And we could have many of those relatively dense, because every time we look out of the window, we don't see the neighbor. Now you could say, okay, now this is fair enough, we can have this in some sort of peripheral environment, but look at this one. This is a square in uh, Valletta, in Malta, and the first floor, which is of course the floor that uh, has the wonderful living room and all the rest of it, is masked by these trees. I, I couldn't go inside. I assume that when you go inside and you look out of the window, you don't look entirely into the tree, you look half over it, so this is beginning to form a new datum, as if this is sort of your lawn in front of the window on the first uh, floor, probably needs to be further investigated, but you see that there are people who are willing to give up on being seen and looking at others as a form of showing their wealth for another kind of quality. And even there exist historical examples for this kind of thing. Another project that I find really interesting in that sense is this one at the Woodhouse uh, by RNCM and Fosso um, Roche, where you have the outside spaces uh, netted, they are kind of masked by a net, the natural vegetation grows against it and is pruned 
code to form these outside rooms against these nets, like this at an early stage, maybe three to five years after planting, and eventually form these kinds of outdoor rooms. When I think about this, I could imagine that we can have a relative density of that sort, but then we're running into a problem, because if we let this outdoor space be wild, there will be uh, perhaps some wildlife, and we need to organize in some way the circulation. So which either way you do that, you begin to realize that at some point there are cul-de-sacs, there are traps there, uh, which probably lead to undesirable situations which require three-dimensional solutions. To, so larger aggregations of these buildings in three dimensions would be quite interesting because then you could provide together with the construction also this three-dimensional circulation that makes us a little bit frictionless. Good. Now I want to show you a few projects done by students that have begun to think about these kinds of issues, starting with issues of the ground. This is a diploma project done in 2012 for a project that wanted to come up. This is sort of like a very typical project in Norway with a system for summer cottages or, or second homes as they are called. Uh, but in this case, the person that was working with this wanted to make the building particular to the terrain and to the airflow conditions and to the solar exposure that is related to that. First off, it's very easy to obtain terrain information in Norway because you can just download it from a governmental website. The whole of the country has been scanned uh, at different degrees of resolution, but I think by and by now the one centimeter uh, tolerance is becoming the norm. So you get the very accurate description of the, the terrain that you can work with. He picked three sites looked at prevailing wind directions, looked at the sun path, and developed three uh, sort of variants on the prototype that has an inner envelope and an outer envelope with the transitional space in between. The outer envelope is informed by uh, a kind of simulation that derives the form from the simulation of the wind. And it is che checked against the solar exposure of the different parts of the envelope, which also has implications for daylight getting into the building. This is important in Norway, particularly in the winter. Whereas the inner envelope is developed according to other considerations to do with occupation and how you produce a private space in a kind of landscape interior. assumptions that we have and to try and bring them to the full scale. This connects a little bit to the work that Ciro and Chris know uh, from the previous work that uh, I was involved with. Uh, so we're working with form finding methods on a model scale, bringing this up to an installation scale and eventually to a building scale. These are two buildings uh, that we did in Chile in 2012 and 2014 respectively. And it's this building that I want to talk about. It's a community center that we designed with the students and built with the students in one semester. That means, of course, that uh, certain ways of constructing are not uh, possible because they are just too costly in terms of time and effort. But the, the center has about 120 square meters enclosed with the roof terrace on top. This is located in Pumanke, a village that was destroyed in the 2008 earthquake. Existing buildings in this village have only one floor, mostly because nobody can afford to build two floors. So we said uh, if we cannot afford this either, we will at least make the roof accessible and give an, a little additional piece of uh, space to that house. But the important thing I want to draw your attention to is this green wall uh, and this membranes here which are partly for shading the roof and partly for shading the wall. Because it occurred to us that in this part uh, of Chile, 
Winter's not a problem that's very much inland, but sun is a problem. The sun hammers down immensely, and most of the, the um, building performance and its kind of microclimatic operations to do with keeping the sun out. So we wanted the lower volume to have some sort of screen board to mask the windows to regulate the light. But when we started doing the analysis of the shadow casting in different seasons of the membrane canopy, we actually began to realize that these membranes that didn't seem to go very much over the roof, if we just pull them a little bit further down, can also shape the walls and can afford us the possibility of uh, having larger cutouts, meaning windows, larger openings that would uh, not be exposed to the sun. So basically, a kind of loop where the of the design of the membrane canopy and the shadow cast would allow us to alter the screen wall and also produce openings to it. So here you have the side with the openings. Because these surface areas are always, we pull these membranes a little bit further down, are always shaded by the membranes. And if there are, the sun is even further down, you can see here a row of trees. These trees provide the remaining bit of the shading. So the roof, and this is the side which didn't need the membrane because of the presence of the trees. Uh, so this is sort of an, an initial attempt to try and deal with perhaps an earlier uh, understanding of performance-oriented design, which is more about environment, architecture and environment interaction rather than integration, but it's already beginning to take into consideration other uh, features that exist in the site. I want to show you one project that won the Oslo Research Prize, much to our uh, surprise, really. The Oslo Research Prize is a prize given for research obviously focused on Oslo, and it's normally won by social geographers that find out something about new demographic trends in Oslo. So we thought, how about if we just build on this research? We look what the demographic trends are and we try to design for them as a kind of projection uh, into the future of what the city might need. This project is located right at the corner tongue-in-cheek, but there's a new tube line going below here, so it would be relatively easy to introduce a new opening here. And we needed a bit of green to explore this kind of interaction between architecture and the, the green area around it. So this became an integrated model where, on the one hand, we looked at items specific to the, the object, for instance, the geometry, structure analysis, looking at the slopes to see whether the slope in this kind of awkwardly shaped building are walkable, but at the same time also we receive enough daylight and what is the thermal impact on the building. We even made the program malleable to move around, and then a kind of elaborate envelope system that I will talk about a little bit. This building is trying to do something about providing public access and space within the footprint of the building. This path that winds around this interior core, which is the programmed and interior circulation service, is entirely public. The building has many public functions. It is an extension of the nearby music school where you can go and listen to rehearsals. So it's bringing those things which are normally enclosed into contact with other people uh, and the cooking school. The point here was that the realization of the demographic trend in Norway is, that, or rather in Oslo, is that the population is beginning to be younger. The younger population normally uh, has children at the age between 20 and 25. So they need to go pick up their child from the kindergarten around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, go home, feed their children, and then by the time the children go to bed, there is something to be done, either work or go out. To something, to a museum or any such place, is not possible because by that time everything is closed. So the building was trying to cater for that and at the same time make the building extensively an interface 
with public circulation and to introduce also a space for green into the building. And the analysis of the building in terms of its environmental performance also took the surrounding vegetation into consideration. So that means in order for the building to operate in the anticipated fashion, you have to take care of the trees around it. It's really quite interesting. Uh, we tried, of course, to bring that everything that we designed always to uh, a point where uh, things are buildable. So this was done with Bolling and Roman's office in Oslo, which has uh, about 10 people sitting there uh, that are that were working on the new uh, uh, the new museum in, uh, in uh, the Moon Museum in the floor. But let's go to a larger scale. Let's go to a scale where we are um, proliferating architectures into uh, a denser configuration. So what I want to show you now is a project that we did in 2014 with the students. This is the site of the Oslo uh, East Fjord, a very steep sloped surface here. And nobody builds there because um, yeah, it's probably easier to make a couple of million euros and buy yourself a piece of land up there than imagining that it's possible to build here. What we wanted to see, can we build there, maintain green corridors, maintain the possibility for wildlife moving around, uh, informing the whole configuration by an analysis of the terrain and at the lower part by the tide. And could we at the same time involve here one loop, one iterative process of looking at the individual units and uh, that they get the appropriate amount of daylight and thermal exposure. So that required what you guys are already engaged with in the lab, it required that we had to make a, a very detailed terrain model. Bison was not around at the time, so sections had to be cut in a particular way that is cumbersome. But we could already script our own water runoff analysis. But more importantly, we looked at the slope evaluation, and this is actually trying to find out are there implied pedestrian circulations in the site that exist because there are certain height lines which are continuous along which you can move uh, with only small insertions or small modifications of the landscape. And this was interesting to find out that the site had this kind of possibilities and this became one of the driving factors for the distribution of the buildings. And then, of course, we had to do the, the analysis of the individual units as part of it. In the lower part of the site, we developed a script informed by you know, 100 years of record of tile differences to try and see, because normally you would build a solid raised embankment there, but could we leave this situation, allow this to be flooded, and then just rather compensate on the scale of the buildings by having some areas that are allowed to flood and other areas where the building is actually doing the trick without changing the situation here right by the water. One more project of that sort. Um, this year is also this peninsula here is near so over the next 20 years to go from 700,000 to 1 million people in the urban core, in the larger metropolitan area from 1 million to 1.5 million, which means that a lot of buildings have to be built, and the neighboring areas already receive pressure for densification right now. This work is still largely on the interior agriculture, and so along the perimeter of the peninsula you see all sorts of houses cropping up, people are trying to buy relatively quickly now before the real rush on the island starts. It's about a 20 minute ferry ride from here to the center of Oslo, so it's quite a, a convenient and pleasant situation. But the question is what does densification entail in terms of uh, the terrain, the environment? I showed you this earlier on, so the traditional architecture, which is, this is from further up north in Norway, takes a 
advantage of the different situations in the terrain. And up to the present moment, the individual small buildings and this open do the same. But this is a site for a larger construction in this. working alone, 
He has to be able to use the smallest tractor there is, which is approximately this wide. It would fit through here, which meant that the wine rows have to be slightly further apart than normal. So it's an adaptation already. You might not see that it's an adaptation, but once you know the story, it begins to be quite interesting because on each terrace, there is a, an implementation of small steps in the soil, which ha has been imported as a solution from South uh, Africa, something that they do there very often when the slopes are too steep to go with the tractor. It was brought in here, so it's basically really already a hybrid of sorts. These terraces, they have from ancient time uh, a water system running here, so the rainwater is supposed to run off not only this way, washing the soil down the terrace, but to run off in this way. So you have curvature towards the, the um, main water spine, which goes down here, and at the bottom you have a main uh, grain mill operated by the water. Here you can see it a little bit better. This is where the water is running off. So all these terraces are sloping in this direction as well as a little bit in this direction. And here you may just about see the, the different steps in the soil and this kind of solution that comes from South Africa. So when we went there for the first time, it was actually on a holiday, I was sent there by a colleague, but I think this colleague knows me very well, so he knew what he was doing. He sent me there, started talking with the vineyard owner, why was he rebuilding the terraces and so on. He said, ah, oh, yeah, okay, great that you asked, because you are doing a lot of research on this. And there are different kinds of theories what the, the um, terraces do. But the problem is, these farmers, they have asked for subsidy from the government. And the government said, OK, we'll give you subsidy if you can give us hard data on two questions. We want hard data that is the proof on the terraces with the dry stone walls actually really changing the microclimate in such a way that you get two more hours of photosynthesis. And we want to know from you the exact costs of building and maintaining a running meter of dry stone water. So I can already tell you the first question we answered, the second we couldn't answer. So the government withheld the subsidies to these farmers. But nevertheless, they declared this area a special landscape area in Italy, of which there are only 10 or 12. So we managed to do something. We still didn't save the farmers from their economic predicament. So I started asking who's involved with this research. There were many different people from uh, the University of Florence, from the Department for uh, Landscape, Agriculture, and Forest Systems. There was an enologist from the University of Parma, all sorts of people. And by chance, I had also met a couple of years earlier somebody who's at the university uh, in Florence doing um, documentation of historical buildings with drones and so on. So I thought this is kind of a historical building. I went to her, I said, Grazia, please, we're doing this historical landscape. She said, yeah, perfect. We just wanted to start this line of research because uh, this kind of diffuse heritage structures, as they call them, are beginning to be very, very important for the government, and we need some hard documentation on that. Before we knew it, one week later, there were 40 people on site working with us. We didn't have one cent to spend. We had no, nobody had raised any grants, no money, but there were 40 people there. These are the people from the geographic arm of the uh, Italian military. They came to do the whole GPS marking for us on the site, presumably because we promised them that they would get the 3D model, so it's a, it's a good thing. You exchange in goods. They also paid for a company to come with their drone and the pilot to be there with us for three days to do photogrammetry and the thermography um, campaign on the site. Meanwhile, we had arrived with our students with industrial grade uh, weather stations to be placed on the terraces uh, to, to actually determine at a certain spacing away from the wall and from the terraces, how much the microclimate change, changes. So we were setting this up. <coughs> and then it turned out, somehow very late in the process, a microclimatologist came in and he said, your temperature sensors are not fine enough. So we had to go back and make 
very quickly this kind of Arduino units, I didn't trust them. I thought, okay, if we have to calibrate them, we will never, this will never be a useful result in terms of the decimal points of temperature. But we had by, by chance uh, a visiting professor in our interaction design department that came in there and gave us some tricks by which we could calibrate these units and also check them that they were correct. So beside our weather stations, we had to then pull these ones out. This gave us a lot of data. Uh, in some ways, this also failed because um, there was no Wi-Fi signal in the area, or it was very patchy. That meant that we lost several weeks of uh, data at the time. We had to go there from Norway to harvest the data with laptop, so by being there, which was a bit cumbersome. <coughs> it was not meant to be like this. So all of a sudden, we had not only the data set that is publicly available from the nearby meteorological station, we had data from our uh, photogrammetry and thermography campaigns, we had the data from our uh, individual measure stations. Then we thought, isn't it nice that you have some students that you can torture? So we came up with the idea, why don't you guys design a little research center into this terrace landscape without changing the microclimate. Sounds all easy, no? but uh, the point is, of course, you have requirements for inside, you have requirements for outside. The outside requirements are given by the plants, the inside requirements are given by the laboratory requirements, and so on. The first thing the students were overwhelmed with the interrelation between the different factors that influence one another. So they very quickly looked for a way of mapping this and found certain mind mapping techniques that are uh, open door, openly accessible online and uh, started organizing their thinking with these kinds of tools, <coughs> while at the same time beginning to design and making the data operational in Rhino and then uh, Grasshopper. So I will cut the long story short. I will just show you two strategies that they came up with. They are both relatively obvious strategies, but they actually managed to work this out also with the proof, at least according to the simulations, if you trust such data, that um, their interventions would not change the environment. So strategy number one was to put the main rooms underground and only have an area for uh, outside work and uh, entry and exit to the building. So you can imagine it a little bit like this. This is the outside structure, and these are the underground units, and here the angulation of this is not um, arbitrary. It is something to do with sun angles, the heating and cooling of these kinds of surfaces, because all of a sudden you have somewhat more thermal mass in the area. You need to make sure that there's either enough shading or there's not enough uh, hours of direct sun impact so that you don't change the situation here. The other strategy that students developed was to atomize the research center into a series of individual interventions spread along the main water spine. So you don't have a big construction, you have very, very small constructions. And as you can already see here, these small constructions were integrated with the wall. So whatever was there in additional volume and thermal mass was also shielded by the soil, so to speak. And because of the, the small size of these interventions, the simulation didn't show any kind of measurable change in the microclimate. This was really quite interesting. This began for me this, uh, this interest in looking for people that are working with building physics for the exterior. And we're now beginning a, a research on how a building envelope can be an extension of an urban ecosystem, which implies that you control the space right on the surface and adjacent to the surface in terms of microclimate just as much as you do the interior. Uh, I have this project that is going to probably go a little bit too long, so I will skip this. This is something that uh, the computeratis here would really enjoy. It was a, a project for utilizing uh, robots and drones for uh, ecological maintenance of the Venice Lagoon, but I will go into this. This would take too long. I will go straight here. Current research question, which is the last bit that I want to talk about. Now I want to start with this diagram by Julian Vincent. 
The one on the left is called solving problems the technological way. The one on the right is called solving problems the biological way. On each one of these diagrams, you have a scale from nanometer up to kilometer. And you have sort of the percentage of uh, the conditions that are most determined for the solutions. And those being information, energy, time, space, structure, and substance. And when you look at the millimeter to kilometer range, which is the one that we normally work with as architects and planners, you will find that energy, space, and substance, meaning material, take the very large portion uh, of the way in which we solve problems. If you look at the same scale range in biological solutions, you will find information, time, and structure being uh, very important. So I was interested in this diagram because there's all this talk about big data and so on. Uh, so, so we have a kind of potential excess of information, but I will say that only potential because there's something to be said about that. So if we get more information, for me the question is, can we offset with that the need for uh, energy or space or substance in this kind of manner. So I'm not trying to do something biomimetic here. I'm just trying to say if these diagrams bear any meaning and we change somehow the importance of this bit here to this, so that means that information is beginning to acquire a much greater uh, aspect in terms of problem solution, does that affect the other parameters? This is an interesting question, but in 2012, uh, Wright and Thompson published this Mind the Gap diagram, where you have the time axis here and the axis that indicates effort here, and it has four curves. The first one is data creation. So that seems to be the easiest because in the shortest time, you can produce <coughs> the, the maximum volume of uh, data. But then look at this. There's a gap here, and then the next curve is called information. So what's the difference between data and information? It was not elaborated very much uh, in that text, so I had to do a little bit of work to try and come to an explanation for myself. Uh, and I would say data is something that you may collect on a site, you acquire it, you get it from the internet, something, but it's unstructured stuff, numbers of sorts. It doesn't tell you anything unless you come to it with a question. <laughs> Now, when you have a question, an inquiry, and you begin to structure the data, you might have something that begins to be actionable and is called information. Then there's an even flatter curve uh, that is to do with knowledge. So how do you come from information to knowledge? Uh, this requires uh, an element of abstraction and generalization so that you are able to take something that you observe somewhere to to somewhere else and, uh, and action it out in some sort of way. And this is where Thomson Reuters somehow perceives a growing gap, uh, that we have plenty of information, but we fail more and more and more to take that step towards knowledge, which then also makes it relatively difficult to go to utility in chief, which means that you also have the methods by which you apply your knowledge. Now, interestingly, as architects, we have heard something about this, and we have a great domain of research activity, or not, sorry, design activity, that uh, already takes into consideration that we have utility and, to some extent, a related knowledge. Right? But I hear very often these days the term data-driven design, and I'm guilty of that too, I use that term, but this term seems to suggest that we go from one step from here to design, which is, in my book, not possible. It just doesn't, cannot produce uh, any kind of um, consciously geared towards results. It can produce other kinds of results, perhaps, but uh, for me the question is how do we go from here to there? So I started to talk to people that are intensively accumulating data, people in the remote sensing field, and I asked them, how, what do you do about taking your, your raw data that you collect towards something actionable that we might call information? And they say, oh, well, you know, we don't do this. I said, what do you mean you don't do this? So you collect this stuff, you, well, what do you do with it? They go like, yeah, we put it into our database. Okay, so then what do you do with it? Nothing. 
Then I said, what's the logic behind it? And I said, well, the logic is we get huge research grants to collect the data. I'm like, okay, so you collect the data and you get paid fine, but what's with the data? Nothing, it's in the storage there. So, so this doesn't really sit in again with me, right? like a, a huge effort made and there's uh, all, all sorts of data accumulating, satellite taken data, data taken by airplanes, by terrestrial stations, by drones, by uh, any means that you can possibly imagine and the data just sits there, nobody does, uh, does anything with it. So I said, okay guys, if you don't do it, could we have access to your database so that we can do something? But I said, no, this wasn't possible. Because there's some sort of agreement that data collected with this type of satellite and that type of airplane and these types of partnerships are not open. So here's the data. Paid by taxpayers money sitting there in that corner, nobody's doing anything with it. It's a very uh, difficult thing to come to terms with, but it actually entails one thing. There are different ways of obtaining data. When you do not have access to already existing databases, then you have to ask yourself how you can acquire this data. Is there any way in which you can go about getting the data? And there's also not a guarantee that the data that has been collected for a particular purpose is actually suitable for you. Even if it is within the domain that you're looking for, it, even if it is within the scale range and you're looking for it, it may not be suitable for your purpose. So we have to bear this diagram in mind. There is not a, a deeper wisdom that I can impart on that, but there is some thinking that gets triggered by that about the nature of data, the accessibility of data, what you need today to do with data in order to make it somehow operational in ways. And we can always check uh, whether somehow the balance between the data acquired and our knowledge is somehow given or whether it goes totally out of bounds. Another line of research that we're doing, and I promise to you I would come back to that, was uh, don't we need to do something about fire? I think there's two great strategies to do something about fire. One has been developed recently by the American president. That strategy is cut all the trees, you don't have fire. Break the ground. Yeah. <laughs> So this, this could be one option, but uh, I was actually thinking, okay, uh, what makes fire that naturally occurs and that is there to renew uh, ecosystems a hazard? Oh, there's one obvious thing. You build in the wrong place. That's obvious. But let's say you have to build in this place. Let's say there's no other thing you can do about it. What makes these fires more hazardous? Well, because the way we build, or the way we intervene with the environment, we get, we get a greater frequency of fire, we get longer duration of fire, and we get a higher intensity of fire. When bushfire occurs, which kind of refreshes the environment, there's two survival strategies largely for plants. Either they burn and they just protect their seeds and then the environment gets reseeded with these plants, or they have a green core. No matter which strategy, the importance is the fire comes and it needs to be moved forward quickly. So this type of plant of which you see a burnt trunk, this is called a grass tree. We did uh, an analysis of this stuff in uh, Australia some 10 years ago and we were trying to, to further this research. It shows that these plants actually have a highly combustible resin that immediately burns as soon as the, the fire arrives and it encodes the outside. But before the rest of the material can start to burn, there's a big time gap. Now, this, this tree would have to burn at least another half an hour before the other material starts to burn. So the combustible material burns, there's nothing else to burn, the fire moves on. Zook, gone, and the ecosystem can refresh itself. So all we need to do, I say that with a big smile, is to build in such a way that we don't change the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of the fire, um, and that we somehow step for a moment out of the way when necessary. Then we should actually be able to not cut down the trees and still build what we have to build in these kinds of places, uh, and take these kinds of considerations into 
into the design. For me, this is truly parametric design because you have to understand the, the essential parameters which are unavoidable without destroying the, the environment and organize them so that you can do a meaningful design intervention. One more research that we're doing at the moment is looking into hatch laying. This is a very old technique of making fences. You have trees that get cut, 80% not laid sideboards, 20% are still connected, so they stay alive, and then you grow these hedges. It's a heavily labor-intensive uh, work because this all has to be done by hand. That's why it's not done anymore. Instead, we're putting up all sorts of metal fences and so on. So what's the purpose of these hedges? On the one hand, those were fences so that cattle doesn't run, run away and, uh, and so on. Uh, the next purpose is that these are actually windbreakers. They, they, they produce a particular microclimate in the area. And thirdly, uh, there are uh, little ecological corridors where certain uh, creatures live, where certain species live. And also, these hedges are part of a, a kind of economy of regenerative design, where you harvest material for building that needs to be cut out on an annual basis. The problem is it's very labor intensive. It's costly. That's why it's not done. But we live in a time of robots, and yes, we can use them to build all sorts of pavilions, but I'm actually uh, wondering whether we can employ them in these kinds of processes to truly get a regenerative logic back into our economy in some way or another uh, that helps us deal with uh, excessive labor costs in some sort of way, but at the same time helps us to obtain materials locally, etc. And finally, I just had to, I asked uh, Ciro yesterday, do you really want me to go into, so I have one example of something really outlandish that we're looking at right now. And this, you know this because you see that every day you open an Elsevier book, you see that on the logo of Elsevier. This logo here. This, what this is showing is a, a wine plant growing into a tree. This technique is called Vita Maritata, and it's an old technique of growing wine, which is basically just copied from nature, because presumably when wine first occurred, somewhere it had to climb, so it climbed into the trees, and humans mimicked that. They made various forms of techniques out of this. You see here, it's really quite incredible by spreading ropes and letting the, the wine go across and then having, where the trees are too far apart, support structures or splicing to get double the amount and so on and so on. And it's really quite uh, interesting. And at the same time, these structures also begin to make spaces. I'm quite lucky because I have access in Munich to a guy who's really crazy. He's doing this stuff all the time. Uh, his name is Ferdinand Ludwig, and he's professor for bow botanic. In other words, he's like growing his buildings in some sort of way. Um, and every time we discuss, we go into some sort of uh, strange corners of the library, and we find some new techniques of this. So for me, this is perhaps one other way of justifying and making useful and building even a kind of local economy in this relation between architecture and environment. To my mind, you could make the obvious argument that if this forms an inhabitable space, then you have your architecture and environment integration. I leave this argument to others. For me, the integration also has to do with other more typical architectural interventions, like making buildings in some sort of typical format and relating this to these uh, situations. Because I think we're a long way away if we ever reach there that we will grow our buildings. So to have solutions within the foreseeable future, um, this relation between techniques like this, technology, labor considerations, ecological considerations, considerations about how we perceive our environment, 
considerations about whether our cultural routing and practices and landscape practices allow us to recognize and engage with the surface space or new architecture. These are all in some way integrated. To account for all of this is a humongous job, but as you know, every time you do something for the first time, it's incredibly difficult. The next time it's a little bit easier, you can integrate something else and you can work your way forward in this. So, at the beginning of this lab, I told you I have no answers to anything. I have a lot of questions. And all I did now um, is I shared these questions with you. And as I finish my lecture, I just offer you this little poem here that I found. And I thank you very much. Plant hedges, 
as ecosystems where the material is also perhaps locally usable for some purpose or another. And that's not a bad thing of compensating in one way or another for impact of transformation. So what does regenerative then mean in this sense? It's about uh, negotiating impacts and compensations in some sort of way, but it's not a zero-sum game. Maybe we have some questions, or I, or I can uh, go on a little, a little bit more. Um, so following with, following with that, um, the idea that it, it won't be zero, so it might tend to zero, but it, it, won't, it won't be zero. Um, I don't know, it's maybe a, a little generic question. Uh, maybe, but um, what do you think architecture has to give to these um, existing technologies? Let's say the, the vernacular technologies, but also the, the technologies of uh, nature itself, uh, avoiding the definition of nature, obviously. But. May I give a generic answer to the generic question? Uh, I, I think that I have balanced the, and I, I, it's always my intention to balance the examples and the, the, the areas in which we are looking for stimuli for ideas between vernacular examples, natural examples, and contemporary architectures, or, or, or just, just before. Uh, maybe not today, but maybe from last year or from 10 years ago, contemporary architecture. So maybe that's a very generic answer, but I, I think that is already pointing in the direction that I do believe that we can get very good clues from, from architectures. But very often we end up looking at extraordinary buildings. And we somehow have to make the shift from the extraordinary to the ordinary. We have to say, what if this is the new normal? If this is sort of the basis, the architecture unit is not that which is today an architecture unit. You start from another building that was never meant to be proliferated, and we just look at the consequence of doing that. And at the same time, by understanding the environment very good, making the necessary modifications to this, because we don't just want to rubber stamp middle of a greenhouse. We want to modify it to the climate where it stands, to the terrain where it stands, to the surroundings which are there, to the expectations that uh, people have to inhabit a certain landscape, uh, where you also find these kinds of spaces. I think architecture has to give a lot. But if we leave a particular project in the domain where it is, we cannot move forward. We have to also be willing to take a certain architecture and say, okay, this was in this domain of reading architecture, but we take it into another domain of reading architecture, and we confront it with other with other influences, and then we'll see what we get from that. And I think this is what architecture can contribute. I think there's a lot of super interesting uh, and potentially really valuable source projects, but they are source projects for me. This is where it starts and not where it ends. And shifting the domain uh, of the reading of this work is really important. I think Chris is calling for a I had a question about, I can't remember where, where it was. I think it was in Norway. It was the houses on the mountainside. Yeah. And it struck me that one of the issues that that was approaching with not only the amount of units, but the, the distribution was at a certain moment, the structural implications are more, and just on an empirical level, have a greater impact than the architectural, like you can have the units, but it's like the need to construct a road or the need to get all the other the structure dimensions applying so which electrical has potentially a greater impact on the units themselves. So I guess the question is, for this like, project, what is it an architectural problem versus something else? Or? For this project, uh, the solution was a radial access into the site. But uh, 
in the site, all the circulation is pedestrian and it happens over this new datum established by the rules. But we were trying to figure out how can we solve the issue that the fire brigade or an ambulance has to reach to the center most units. And uh, this project didn't solve it. I think infrastructure is a really big problem, but infrastructure is also now a, a kind of field of discussion that will probably be pretty much in flux over the next couple of years. Uh, it's a very um, difficult to predict where things are going in terms of individual uh, traffic and all these kinds of things. So I don't want to escape this. I recognize this as a, as a serious pro problem. Uh, and I'm very honest to say that we have no solutions yet where nobody has speculated and in, uh, intensely enough research in that, uh, in that direction. Okay, are you interested in like the metabolis or late core or the projects that in the 60s also saw uh, hybridizations between those things? Or is that yes, but I always have Fumi Komaki's uh, critique of the heart metabolism in mind, uh, which produces configurations of uh, circulation and unit distributions which are very difficult. But he, he also indicates some other projects which are hierarchically more structured, and then it begins to be interesting, because then you can say something is more modifiable, something is less modifiable. So if we talk about metabolism, then I would like to see the type of metabolism that started working on hierarchically structuring the different systems out of which the, the settlement or the aggregation of units is constructed. I think we have a question here. William, if I can reach him. Um, as you said at the beginning then, Performance is a very contested uh, concept. So um, my question is, how do you prevent the, I guess, the knowledge that you're producing uh, from from getting into into from being commodified too quickly, from getting into the hands of people who um, have a different kind of concern for performance, where it's about. Um, basically uh, making money out of it, um, only or mostly. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of, um, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess there's, a, there's a line between uh, really kind of transformative knowledge that is uh, um, pursuing some uh, interests that um, are not just about uh, uh, generating some kind of income, but rather about you know, uh, creating possibilities for certain things to happen. But uh, what one sees often is that um, a similar discourse or, or, or a branch of the discourse of performance is very much in the hands of uh, other um, people who um, yeah, who basically just extract a lot of uh, profit out of it. Uh, I don't know commercially, and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it turn and it turns some of, or it, I think there's a risk, and there's also, there's also some kind, some degree of reality to the fact that uh, it loses the, the depth of, of the knowledge. I don't know how you deal with that, or if you have been, or if you have uh, ever been in a situation where you have to confront that something like that. I, uh, you know, I'm paid by the taxpayer, so the knowledge that I may be lucky enough to produce one day or uh, belongs into the public domain, so I, I, I really think that uh, I participate in the knowledge sharing economy. And when I get depressed uh, at the moment, I call my friends and we have a lot of beer, we wine, and that's it. <laughs> but, I no, I, but, but but I just very just very quickly. But but I guess you you um you know that um, it's more than just that because you you're putting a, a tool out into the world. You know. So 
Take 3XM, GXM. This is an office in uh, Denmark, do you know them? Uh, I don't know. GXM was started by a young guy called uh, Kasper Müller Jensen. And their line that I hear very often in their presentations is that uh, they share what they produce. Except if it's a project that is financed, because the GXM, the research unit, is a separate business unit. They need to finance themselves. They get hired in by 3XM on the project when something needs to be solved. And in that case, it might actually be a situation where the intellectual property belongs to 3XM. Everything that GXM, according to their claim, produce, they make part of the public domain. And this is how they profile themselves, that they have the capacity to produce these kinds of things. They don't want to produce bits of software that they sell to you. They want to sell to you the capacity to do these kinds of things. And in a way, this makes sense to a certain extent, because if you can get this from them for free, why would you invest to compete with them? Because you're getting it anyhow. So they do their thing. They maintain their area of expertise. It's actually guarded by the fact of sharing. It's an attitude. It's, it's, it might not work, but I find it a very sympathetic attitude. Now, other people, other offices organize themselves around bits and pieces that they produce as intellectual property that they sell. It's also an OK thing. Uh, if I look at here on Timberlake, they produce bits of uh, software or measuring equipment. But at the same time, you have their director of research, maybe Fairclough, traveling the world and telling you everything about it. So you again you have access to it to some extent. Maybe you don't have the source code, but you know that they're working on these kinds of things. And she's talking about it while these things are under development. I think this level of generosity is the best way of moving forward because in this world you cannot avoid being exploited or if somebody takes something or whatever. In fact, we should even be honored if somebody finds something we have produced good enough to steal it. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a very bad business person, you know. I would be rich now in uh, doing other things if I would be a good business person. I'm not a good business person. I, I, I like doing this kind of research and uh, since I'm paid by the taxpayer, what I do belongs to society. That's how it is. That's my deal. It seems like, okay, so, that, that, that Jesus thing. so my question from that is, I mean, you, you mentioned like you can't jump from the data to the form, yeah. right? And it seems to me that one of the things, one of the issues is a lot of time the data is driven, it, it sort of trades in a, I don't know what used to be called the nodes, right? It's like natural law here. I study the ventilation patterns, I study the solar winds, here's the here's the, the logic in which it generates, and now we get the form. That somehow magically precipitates out of the nomos of the systems, right? Whether it's economic systems or natural systems. Right? But it also seems like well, in the history of modernity, especially about well, least, there's also a political project or a project of the logos, the project of the social, that is always coupled to that. And it seems like when you are also, you know, when, you're, when you speak of, say, the collapse of the extended envelope or the layering of the envelope into the, the economy, there's, it's actually, that, that statement is so loaded also with a political agenda, I think. So, and I, I, I couldn't help but think of, say, Neutro or Schindler and their work in LA and how, you know, even something like, but Joy of Corner Glass is a political statement as well as an aesthetic statement. You can't decouple those two things. So I'm curious as to how, because you can, you can translate, you know, a lot of these things into different agendas. Right, you could have butt joint glass, or you could not have butt joint glass. So I'm so interested in what are the aesthetic political projects. Like, how do you? I mean, it seems like it has to have that. Otherwise, it's just otherwise you do get that short circuit from the data to the to the object, which then just becomes a way of justifying, in a full commodity sense, how to have a sales thing. Yeah, I have to have some answers uh, to that in a couple of weeks' time. There's uh, uh, summer school on simulation taking place at the ETH Harvard. They come, they come from the cognitive side and uh, they 
actually asked me to come there and then give an answer to that question. I don't have this question at this moment in time. Uh, I am, of course, a political being, and so uh, anything that I do will be politically loaded in some fashion or another. Uh, I would like to say that um, for me, the interesting thing is always to go uh, beyond purely doing a series of environmental simulations, coupling them and then getting a result. There's another agenda. Uh, that they ask, I really don't even know how to approach this. So it's a really lot of work to 
to go there and to make a, a, a kind of elaboration of the question of perception of density from an architectural perspective that is taking a lot of those things on board. Uh, so I come back from there. The next person I'm talking to is the Maubutani uh, guy who wants to show me the latest research on the, the uh, bridges. So I, it's right now, I, I, I enjoy this very much. It's a kind of frenetic interdisciplinary discourse. And I'm beginning to realize that uh, I cannot really encounter your questions because I haven't spoken enough to architects recently. <laughs> this is uh, the, the trap of um, this kind of work. You get probably sucked out of a necessary discourse that you should be engaging with because you're busy with too many other things. But frictionlessness in the design process in the, with emphasis on producing something of its own particular recognizability, I think that's perfectly fine. And it will be generated, uh, in our case, very often in the confrontation between uh, knowledge fields that we really don't know to, to bridge. Uh, there are going to be lots of kinks and, and uh, interruptions and, and things in there. But if we want to be more deliberate about that, then we have to make even these moments somehow operational. I haven't really thought about that from the design perspective, but I think these are really interesting questions. Maybe you can help me, maybe we can collaborate on that. No, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not joking, actually. I'm very serious about that. Like, uh, how should I say that? No, no, we're putting several research grant applications together, and they're all sort of on an inter disciplinary footing, but with the purpose of answering particular questions uh, that are strongly related in the domain of architecture. But I find that uh, very often there are no other architects that want to engage with this. I think. And when, you look, when I look at the group of people that I'm working with right now, and my wife is the only other architect. And then the rest of the people are doing all sorts of things, so no matter what. And uh, then I have to be careful to, to balance this, because if there's too many people in there from an engineering approach, then it's only about coupling simulations. And coupling simulations only uh, is, for me, not the way of designing. It's, it can be a part of a way of designing, but it is not the way of encountering the multitude of questions that we have to, to address in architecture. So. If the impression has uh, arisen here that this is sort of like uh, interdisciplinary coupling of simulations and then we all be fine, this is really not the point because what, I, what I'm trying to do is always to look back at architectural resources. I, I think that's probably the best way in which I can call them resources uh, because um, uh, a project like Vina Mubadi's Glasshouse can suggest very many things. But there are very many things still need to be altered from the, the, the source. They need to be altered in some sort of fashion. And some of these things probably have to do with external input, but some of these things also have to do with an architectural imagination. I don't think that the um, building physics people would come up with the result that would vaguely resemble what we would do as architects. Or, yeah. Phenomenal qualities that we can't even talk about anymore. Yeah. Us, right? But also the political qualities. That are... uh, that, that's interesting uh, about the, the kind of interaction with these people from this cognitive research center because uh, they expect somehow from our side this input. Uh, but but the, the field of discussion in which this takes place is they get like 30 students with a master degree uh, done on some kind of specialized simulation. So they are there because they want to get some sort of interoperability between the tools and their methods. And then I should support, I'm supposed to come in and talk about something else that is not really the matter or of interest for the people that are joining this, but for the people that are organizing this. So it's, it's really interesting how you balance the different expectations in these, these kinds of settings. Michael, maybe one last question? There's also another over there. I think we have one. Mm -hmm. 